Hello, this is Jeffrey Fox yet again. This is lesson five of the first unit of the Big Data Applications and Analytics course. Uh, this is part of the Indiana University School of Informatics and Computing Data Science curriculum. Uh, I'm going through details of units in this, um, in this course. Remember the course has sections, units, it has 33 units. And a unit is roughly uh, 30 to 60 minutes, uh, there's about 30 hours of video in all, and there's 33 units. And units are based, broken up into lessons. And this is the fifth lesson of the first unit, the introduction to the course. Course introduction, here we are. Okay, let's go for it. Well, we've given you um, two thirds of the uh, course already, because remember there, was, there are three, um, Lessons which describe the course contents, and now we um, we just to told you about the cloud parallel computing and cloud computing, and did the discussion of the last lesson. Uh, the first uh, discussion on this lesson is um, the use case of web search and information retrieval and text mining. And I say there are two units, part one and two. We do a general survey of data mining. We define the web and text search problem. We discuss uh, history of libraries and things like that. Uh, the core information retrieval technology is actually pretty old. Some techniques like Boolean queries, fuzzy indices, the vector space. Well, I pointed out earlier that the really key idea is mapping abstract problems into spaces. And uh, that's done here as well, and you have a, it's not necessary to do that, but one of the more powerful methods is based on that. We have a discussion of probabilistic models, and the famous um, um, discussion of frequency versus Bayes as the interpretations of probability. This is an old area, I remember reading about this when I was a, a very junior assistant professor at Caltech, uh, doing physics data analysis, I read, or at that time, all this stuff was very new, and I was uh, building my knowledge of statistics and probability for the first time. And I remember long discussions of that, and as far as I know, the situation isn't actually resolved, except Bayesian methods, which even then were known to be uh, probably the best approach, or still the best approach. Uh, we look at data analytics used in web search. In the sort of detail, we go through document preparation, forming the inverted index, constructing the index, uh, how you do query structure and processing. Then we get on, this is sort of the core, very old information retrieval. A lot of the very important um, capabilities you now see come from the use of context and the joining all the information together. Um, because when you type a search, it knows who you are. It knows where you live, it knows what you do, it knows what you last did, and so you can use that to <coughs> optimize its response. And one of the things it does is link structure analysis, which is ranking, um, using the number of links uh, to a page to rank the page and things like that. And that's where page rank comes from. It was one of the founding principles of Google when it was set up. This is then summarizes the whole area of a web search, discusses how to do or build a search engine. You have to crawl the web. We have a bit of discussion of web advertising. And we return to clustering and topic models, where instead of clustering items or people together, usually in the case of e-commerce, you cluster items together because you're trying to find which items are near each other, which people might like. In the case of um, Web search, you're clustering news items, even uh, clustering items by their common content. You'll cluster all the items on Indiana University's <coughs> sports program or something like that. Now we have, remember, red denotes software. And um, we have Software for PageRank, which is offered in Python or Java. The discussion is the Python discussion. Um, then we go through uh, k-means in detail and do k-means in Python and Java, and that take a case of four artificial clusters and go through in great detail. Then we look at MapReduce, 
um, introduce shooter map produced, which was only done very, very briefly before in the uh, uh, in the motivation. And then we go to advanced topics in map produce about how people are extending it. And then we actually illustrate its use by applying it to k-means. Uh, and using Python, using a sort of by hand version of MapReduce to illustrate the basic principles. So this is um, an example of a technology uh, part of the course. Um, you can do all of this with essentially no knowledge of Python. Oh, and you can completely ignore Java if you don't want it. There's no need to look at this in Java. And Python's actually a more elegant way of doing this part of the course. Because Java only pays off when you're doing large scale production work where the power of Java as an enterprise software environment can be seen. Then we come to uh, one of the newer sections on sports informatics. This section has two units. Uh, it starts with so called Sabre metrics, which is uh, essentially baseball informatics or baseball analytics. I discussed briefly why you choose baseball, and one chooses baseball uh, because it's probably one of the easier one to do very sophisticated analytics on because you can break baseball up into a set of a set of um, unit actions like pitcher throws the ball, batter hits the ball, fielder fields the ball, fielder throws the ball, um, somebody receives or not receives the ball correctly. So at every stage. It's completely mechanical states, rather deterministic. The result, whether they cast the ball or miss it, is not deterministic. Uh, but because you can break it up into small, typically one person interactions, uh, <coughs> that makes it a lot easier to analyze than say a big scrimmage in, in rugby or, uh, or uh, even fo football, where American football, where a lot of players can gather together to, to do a defensive stop. When the quarterback throws the ball to the running back, that's actually like baseball, really only two people involved. Once the uh, at the end of that, there are multiple people involved if you have several defensive players involved. Um, so anyway, baseball is much cleaner. You rarely get multiple people involved in an essential fashion. Uh, even, and most of the people are interacting in pairs, and usually it's in a pair, A does something and then B does something. Like the pitcher pitches and the batter hits or tries to hit. There's a famous uh, movie, Moneyball, describing the 2002 to 2003 Oakland Athletics, who uh, usually thought of as one of the first to use uh, sports informatics and in or base or sabermetrics in a sophisticated fashion, and they were able to produce a competitive team with a much lower budget than, say, the Yankees, who are known for spending the most and actually doing incredibly well. Um, the, there is some interesting discussion in the literature on the relationship between performance of players and dollars, finances, the finances of baseball. Because a good player can just make a small difference, and that small difference can be all the difference between a team entering or not entering the playoffs. And the dollar implication of that is not only quite large, it also depends on the, where you are. Different teams have different. Uh, Playoff entering um, implications because they may have more a different type of fan base. Uh, Atlanta and uh, the New York Yankees have rather different fans. Uh, New York Yankees fans are extremely sensitive to performance. There are some interesting technologies called Pitch FX and Field FX. Pitch FX is the oldest. It essentially is recording using imagery and video the pitcher batter in the case of Field FX the uh, Bad or fielder interactions. And those can be analyzed in detail to provide very sophisticated models for pitchers, which allows you to compare different pitchers, decide which batter to bring in at the right time, and things like that. You can do a tremendously uh, powerful uh, um, piece of software. It can be based on this data. So this data can be taken in real time and used in real time, but it also provides a back end. Uh, source of data which can be used to make models of of a, of a player, which models can decide, tell you how much to spend on that player, and whether that player is likely to make a difference to you. The second unit in this section discusses other sports uh, 
uh, and other issues. It discusses health devices and wearables, because that's sort of broadly related to this area. It discusses other sports like soccer, tennis, and basketball. It points out that spatial visualization is pretty interesting. Uh, you know, that's most clear, say, for basketball, where you have three pointers and two pointers. And you can analyze uh, a player's success uh, by their success as a function of uh, position on the court. That's again a nice example of a, for that sport, which is rather clean, single person analysis. If you're a person X, where on the court do you have much chance of getting a three pointer? There are all sorts of other interesting features like uh, predicting injuries and reducing industry in injuries based on this type of data you have here. Uh, the marketing of sports, betting on sports, and also these fantasy teams that uh, uh, you can play in. These are all interesting areas where sports informatics has impact. Health informatics, that's an area rapidly changed, rapidly varied. I've updated my uh, lectures here. Uh, there's an interesting McKinsey report, a European report, a Microsoft report. Uh, genomics is relevant here because personal medicine is a big deal. And personal medicine is um, supported by data stored in the cloud. And for instance, Google is now offering to store your genome in the cloud in a cost effective fashion. So health informatics is it's always been a big area, but the the um, advent of clouds and the adoption of classic big data techniques is changing the field. It's still a rather hard field to actually find anything else about because of, of uh, privacy issues which allow which stop you from actually finding out what's going on. Uh, so that's an important uh, pro issue. Our next use case is sensors or robots or Internet of Things, which we describe in detail. We talk about sensor clouds. Sensors are particularly suitable for clouds, or the things are particularly suitable because things are small. They're meant to be um, 25 to 70 billion things in the world by 2020. And each of those things needs to communicate with the cloud. And clouds are useful because when a thing wakes up and sends something to the cloud, the cloud can just invoke an on-demand resource to process it. So the type of a sporadic use that the things need to make of the clouds is very suitable to cloud architectures. Now the sensors can be used in the earth, the environmental and polar science areas. It can be used in smart cities, an area that's been predicted to overwhelm us. Smart homes, smart cities. It actually hasn't overwhelmed us still. There's very little. Smart homes are still a very small business, much smaller than people thought it would be. There is something called ubiquitous career, or U, for U, or U career, where U stands for ubiquitous. And that's again the idea of pervasive use of um, Internet of Things around streets and homes and people, and it's all to do with smart watches and wearables and Google Glasses and things like that. And then the final example in this um, area is the smart grid, which is the use of, of uh, big data technology to monitor power usage and, the, and where and save energy and by optimizing power distributions and things like that. And uh, that's almost the last use case. We still have one more to go, which is remote sensing or radar informatics, which we described in an application we know to glaciology. And uh, it causes us all important due to global climate change. The changes now seen in the glaciers are affect strongly, are affected by global, cli by global climate change, and they also impact global climate change. Because the melting glaciers are melted by the warming temperatures, and the melting glaciers then cause the sea level to rise and all sorts of havoc to be raised. Uh, we describe some technology, remote sensing technology, uh, the science of studying glaciers, which are more formally called ice sheets, the f discussing radar, overview and basics, and what we're doing and how we're doing it in a collaboration with Kansas, uh, the Croesus Center. So that's uh, the last use case. Uh, we do not have a 
conclusion section, maybe we should, maybe I'll produce one. But uh, you can go back and read the motivation if you want to conclude, because the conclusions is the same as the beginning. We're in a revolution. This tells you some highlights of that revolution with an application orientation. So now we're almost ready to get started. This is the course overview. Hope you found it useful. This is Jeffrey Fox signing off from lesson five of unit one. Thank you.